Yeah, hello everyone. Um, firstly, John does send his apologies as he clearly cannot make it today. And instead he's asked me to talk on his behalf, um, but he has helped me with the slides. So if there are any questions that you have for John, his contact information is there. Otherwise I will do my best to talk on his behalf. Um, I've been involved in this project since the end of 2022 when it was, uh, I used it as a case study for my PhD, which is ongoing. And I've also been fortunate enough as part of my PhD, I was able to do a six month placement as part of that PhD, which I am currently doing as well, concentrating on the graffiti of the site. So what is Once Then Rediscovered? It is a, uh, it's up on the White Cliffs of Dover and it's managed by the National Trust. It was granted funding in 2022 and is a three year project, uh, which focuses on the concrete uh, gun emplacement sites of World War II uh, emplacements uh, in and around. So the focus of Wonston Rediscovered is focused on a few of those key sites. And the names of those emplacements are Jane, Clem, D2 and Fan Bay, which I'll talk more about in a minute. And volunteers are able to get involved not only in the conservation of these sites, but also the historical research and writing about these sites as well. Uh, it's a very uh, volunteer-led initiative and project, um, I think in part represented by me being here talking on behalf of John, which I don't think is very common. Um, and also, uh, it's also wanting to reach a lot of people and bring in people to the sites that aren't necessarily aware of where it exists. And it's made possible through um, various funding streams as well. As I mentioned, so it is very volunteer led and we're very uh, beneficial at the site where we have a lot of different expertise of the volunteers that are uh, working with the group. Um, so of course there are archeologists that work with the site and we're very uh, grateful to the partners as well that offer their professional expertise such as Isle Heritage. Um, but there's also other volunteers that bring their expertise. So cavers, for example, at the beginning of the site, uh, where there were just literally holes in the ground. Um, they were obviously had the relevance and the expertise and the willingness to go into down these holes um, and bring their expertise in that regard, as well as uh, people like geologists who know about the geology of the White Cliffs, um, as well as people who are able to research as well. And in total, there's been nearly 13,000 of volunteer hours uh, from July 2022 to a, a recent figure that was taken in March 24. And that figure is only for once and rediscovered on the White Cliffs. Oh, okay. In regards to what the volunteers actually do on the site, uh, they typically meet on a Thursday from 10 in the morning till three. And they do a, a number of different site, um, different things. Uh, Man management of vegetation is quite a common thing that they do, as well as um, there's graffiti surveys that they can in get involved with, which is what I mentioned um, I am currently doing with a small team of other volunteers. Uh, securing and conserving the buildings where appropriate also happens, as well as the volunteers get involved in tours of the site when it is open to the public, um, as well as they help with uh, evaluation and data gathering as well. The location of uh, Wonston has just been given here, um, and it's a very, it's located on the corner, or one of the corners of uh, the national of where it extends, uh, abutting Wonston Farm. And the fields around it uh, are managed by various uh, grazing cattle, such as uh, Dexter cows and Exmoor ponies, and it overlooks the uh, port of Dover there as well. And just to give you an idea of where the, the site exactly in regards to the cliff. So you can see Fan Bay is located at the bottom there. And uh, D2 is on the right next to Jane. And Clem, which is another gun site, is on the right there. And Jane and Clem are close mirrors to one each, of each other. So... During the Second World War, the White Cliffs of Dover became the focus for unprecedented land-based artillery installations. 
And after the war, some of the sites were demolished, others were covered up, while many were left dere derelict for nature to reclaim. The project aimed to conserve uh, Wonston and Fan Bay, uh, the most important and well-preserved parts of the sites, and to create an experience that can be enjoyed by generations to come. So Jane and Clem, I've, I've said that those so they're very, two very big guns, and they're 15 inches in diameter, and the shells themselves are also therefore quite big as well, five foot three inches in length. And each of these gun emplacements are served by two magazines each, uh, as well as a power plant. And the shells are moved using overhead cranes and manoeuvred within the site, or were man manoeuvred within the site by trolleys uh, or pulled by small diesel tractor vehicles. And the two guns were served by branch rail lines, both in front and behind the gun emplacement. And they were primarily used for delivery to the magazines. And both were commissioned at different points in 1942. This just gives an idea of the range of the gun sites. So uh, quite an old map here, just to give you an idea. Um, so the Wonston guns, Jane and Clem, have a range of up to 24 miles. Uh, when they're supercharged, and Fan Bay, close to the cliffs there, has uh, about a 14-mile range. Of course, uh, Kent history has uh, a long uh, association with uh, defensive wartime features. However, Dover represented um, a change in the typical narrative in which it saw an offensive tactic, um, which was because of the recognition of the need by Churchill. Uh, this is a, a graphic produced by Neil Short, who was uh, one of the volunteers on the site, and he recently released a book that I would shamelessly plug for you all to get, because I'm sure he would want me to. And you can see just a, an overhead view of what this is, a, a, what Jane uh, would have looked like. So you can see the road that kind of goes uh, around both of the magazines, so you can drive in one end and out the other, and the gun emplacement at the front there with the shelter behind it and the power plant over to one side, and Clem is a very close match of that. And just some photographs I mentioned about, they were moved with overhead cranes, so you can see them uh, being moved on the left there, and the trolley, uh, the little diesel, sorry, tr uh, tractor, uh, that's being moved with the camo netting over the top there. And yeah, just to give you an idea about the scale. So Jane is the closest on the foreground and Clem is the furthest in the background. And you can see the lighthouse that exists on the structure there. And again, you can see the extensed camo netting over the site, um, as well as the other structures that I mentioned as well. So, yeah, during the uh, 1970s, a lot of these structures were uh, covered up during a process called Operation Eyesore. Um, and this is a, a photograph produced by um, Peter Stokes, who was part of the demolition that take part. So a lot of the land was given back uh, in the 50s and 60s and subsequently covered over um, in later years. And you can just see the difference in what um, the la how the landscape would have changed over that time. So you, this is um, an overview of what Clem would have looked like and then what it looked like before the National Trust got involved. So very covered over and um, almost unaccessible to people around it. And in terms of the work that happened at Clem, this is um, two photographs of the type of clearance that volunteers got involved with in February 2023. So you can start to see the roads um, being made clear again, and just the sheer amount of material that was removed from the site was quite extensive. Um, and it's becoming more accessible for people um, working on the site in order to uh, open up the buildings um, in and around Clem. Uh, another map, again, so very useful tool to demonstrate. Uh, th these statistics were taken um, through uh, evaluations through just two of the open days that happened um, at different parts of the programme. Um, so one was for the 
uh, lottery thank you day and then another was during the tours that were given as part of a fan bait archaeological dig and you can just see the breadth um, of where people were visiting from the site so it's pretty extensive the various locations that are people are visiting from when they're giving tours of the site not only within the UK but also within the world so the White Cliffs clearly have a broad range in the type of people that they can potentially engage and during the same set of evaluations, one of the questions was uh, what was enjoyable or could have been done better? And I've just put a few comments that people have said just to highlight the fact that even though people may have been visiting the site, they wouldn't have necessarily known um, that the site was there, even if they were local. So they uh, thought that it was good that they were that these histories were beginning to be opened up and weren't necessarily uh, aware of where they were at the beginning. Uh, so in summary, um, the National Trust and the volunteers and partners are uncovering an important part of Kent's World War II history and helping to reclaim some of the knowledge that was potentially lost in the 1970s. Uh, it's engaged a range of people globally and is revealing history for the local relevant communities. And uh, thank you to all the partners, of course, and again, John's email if you have any questions. But Thank you.